All right, hello and welcome to this webinar presented by Library Instruction Together. Library Instruction Together provides space for teaching librarians across the country to network, collaborate, and discuss trends and innovations in library instruction and information literacy. And we're very pleased to present this webinar for you today. We'd also like to thank the Citadel Library for providing Zoom access for this webinar. This is being recorded, and by continuing to attend this session, you're consenting to being part of the recording. These recordings with captions will be posted on the LIT website um, after the webinar today. We do ask all of our attendees to abide by our code of conduct, which may be found on the About Us page of the LIT website. If you'd like to report an issue, you can always email us at libraryinstructiontn at gmail.com. We have also disabled your microphone, so if you have questions um, for the Q&A session at the end, please place them in the chat box, and we'll do our best to include them at the end of the session. And of course, if you have technical issues, you can always um, direct message um, either myself, Laura, or Erin um, in the chat box, and we will do our best to help you as we can. So I am pleased to welcome today um, Alex Watson, who is Associate Professor and Reference and Instruction Librarian at the University of Mississippi. And he is going to be discussing a pilot workshop on AI art and libraries at the University of Mississippi. So Alex, I will go ahead and pass things over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm happy to be here, um, at least uh, happy to be virtually here, happy to be metaphysically here, however, uh, however the proper uh, thing goes when you're uh, performing virtually. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really heartened to see uh, so many folks that are, uh, that are interested and engaged with, uh, with this sort of issue. Um, I hope you will forgive me for representing myself with a cartoon but I'm going to be mostly using um, a slide deck, and that's probably going to be uh, the major focus for me. So with that said, let me go ahead and get started with that. And, okay. Um, just wanna make sure that everybody can see that okay. Um, if anybody is unable to see it or if the screen didn't share properly, um, go ahead and let me know uh, in the chat. Okay, looks good here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron. All right. So I always like to begin my presentations with a little disclaimer. Um, I call this the enthusiastic amateur disclaimer. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm not intending to present myself as an expert or to say that I have some kind of special knowledge. Um, this is a particularly new, particularly fast moving topic, and there may be people who know more than I do about it, people who are able to provide useful context, and I really do encourage you to share that with me um, in the Q&A or in the chat as we go along. Um, I'm delighted to be educated further on the topics that I'm presenting on. And above all, my intent is to provoke a discussion rather than to be some kind of all-knowing, all-seeing guru who's dispensing knowledge from up on high. So to begin with, um, I'm sure most of you in your personal or professional lives have heard people talking about AI, perhaps in the context of ChatGPT, which is a text-based generative AI, perhaps seeing some of the art um, that has been generated by things like Stable Diffusion or Dolly, which we will talk about in a moment. Um, but I feel like um, a little bit of background is in order for those who may not have, um, have a clear understanding or who may be a bit muddied. It's important to note in this case that this is primarily a marketing term. These are not, this, this isn't HAL 9000. It's not capable of running a starship. Um, it doesn't even have a, uh, a fun little eye that can read your lips. Um, AI, be it uh, text generating, uh, art generating, or any of the other varieties, is a predictive algorithm that uses prior input to determine an appropriate response. Um, the best uh, analog that I can give people in their daily lives is autocomplete on your phone. 
um, the prior input that they use is information that is uh, scraped from the internet. Uh, scraping in this case meaning large-scale automated data collection, either of text, images, or both, usually by a specialized program, not unlike the web crawlers that Google uses to organize and index uh, its search results. Um, this is often done without permission, although the person doing the scraping usually claims that uh, this is covered under um, fair use. So, um, generative AI art of the sort created, um, and you may put created in quotation marks if you prefer, um, uh, by things like um, Stable Diffusion or Dolly 2, um, was trained by images scraped from Google Images, DeviantArt, which is a, um, a fan website that uh, presents art in a variety of categories uh, freely submitted by users. Um, others, and again, this is usually done without permission. There's no way of automatically soliciting permission um, in such a, such a scrape. And even if it were, many of these images are on sites or accounts that are no longer actively monitored. Um, However, I do have to say that describing this, as well as describing all generative AIs, is kind of like a moving target. If any of you are familiar with Lewis Carroll, um, it's a bit of the Red Queen's dilemma. Uh, one must run as fast as they can just to stay in one place. You have to really engage with this kind of ecosystem in order to keep up with it. And as you probably gathered from my disclaimer, even I, after preparing for this presentation and doing all this research, probably am a little behind. Um, so I'd like to go into a few of the ethical problems that are inherent with this um, technology before I move into uh, the results of my particular workshop. Um, the content is scraped without consent. It's also possible to use an artist's style without their consent. Um, the, uh, the generative AI um, art interface uses a similar interface to ChatGPT in that you pose it a question or give it a command, and it will respond to commands, do X in the style of Y, um, draw H.R. Geiger's alien in the style of Charles Schultz peanuts, something like that, um, which would be completely without, uh, without any copyright um, uh, leeway in terms of both of those. Um, and there's also a big concern over replacing artists with generators. We've seen this um, is one of the major concerns that is behind um, some of the Hollywood strikes that are going on right now, which have happened since this was prepared, but pr uh, present an excellent example. Um, and there are also cases, um, I think uh, Disney's Secret War is probably a good example of this type of technology being used um, instead of hiring artists. The um, the opening uh, introduction sequence of Secret Wars is done entirely using generative AI. Um, so, what were the goals of my specific workshop? My goals were to move, for, uh, move toward a framework for um, dealing with generative AI artwork in a library and or instructional setting. And I really wanted to make sure that the voices of actual practicing artists or artists in training um, were foregrounded because I feel like they are often left out of this conversation. It can tend to take on a rarefied abstract air. And I wanted to include people whose training, schooling, and careers are directly affected by this sort of thing. And finally, I was really interested in brainstorming um, about the lack of ethical options that are available for engaging with this technology. Because as we've seen, um, I think I neglected to point this out, but in the previous uh, slide, you can see these are all AI generations that nevertheless have the remains of an artist's signature. So this is the faintest uh, echo of the art that they were originally stolen from. Um, and obviously that presents a huge ethical problem when you're engaging with this technology. So my overall methodology was an open email to the University of Mississippi Department of Art and Art History um, recruiting participants uh, for a uh, 
75 minute workshop using the DAL E2 uh, generative uh, AI art platform. It is provided by the same company, OpenAI, which despite its name is not terribly open, but that's a discussion for another time. It's provided by the same company that uh, is behind ChatGPT, if you're familiar with that. Unlike ChatGPT, um, Dolly2 is a paid service. Um, you're given a certain number of credits. One credit equals one generation, one attempt to generate a piece of artwork. And you receive 50 free credits a month. And anything above and beyond that, you have to purchase at a cost of roughly 13 cents per credit. Um, so in this case, I provided the credits personally with my own money um, so that uh, we didn't have to make our poor starving artists any more starving. And then we also would discuss the ethics with a library focused questionnaire. You can see the questionnaire here. Um, and you can also see the date that the workshop uh, was done, the uh, 3rd of November, 2022. I asked for participants to record their prompts, and I offered them possibilities of metadata to collect for library purposes when um, adding generative images to library collections or otherwise introducing them into a library ecosystem. So here are the workshop results. Um, the number of people that participated were small enough that I am able to go into each of them individually, um, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, if I had been able to attract more participants, I would have had a broader scope of data. On the other hand, with fewer participants, I was able to go into each of them with more detail, and they were also able to have a genuine conversation with me uh, during the workshop. So, interviewer number one was a studio art printmaking MFA student in their final year of study, and they were specializing in screen printing. They were particularly interested in political themes, social unrest, and protest. Um, and as we were discussing the technology at the beginning, they were particularly um, concerned with what I was talking about earlier, the ability to create art in the style of an artist without their permission. So here you can see their first generation. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have actually used Dolly 2, um, but for each generation that you make, each request that you give it to make an image, each credit that you spend, it will generate four individual images. So what you see here is one of the four images that was created for a prompt. Um, you can also see this little dolly to watermark in the lower uh, right. And in the case of each of these generations, I am showing you the one generation out of the four that the participant selected as being the one that best met the criteria that they set forth in the spirit of what they were looking for. There are three rejects for each of them, and I saved them all. So if you are really interested, um, I do have the ability to show you the rejected images, but that may... I figured that was too deep of a dive for our purposes here today. So here you can see that their generation was uh, oil painting of a protest in Mississippi. Other than the quote marks, that is exactly what was gone into. Um, okay, um, what is Dolly? Uh, as I said um, earlier, uh, Dolly is the, um, it's a project by OpenAI, the same people who created um, ChatGPT. And it allows you to generate images from text prompts four at a time in exchange for a credit. You're given a number of free credits and you have um, 50 free ones per month, after which you spend roughly 13 cents per credit. Um, Dolly is a combination of Salvador Dolly and Wally, -E, the friendly robot from Pixar. Um, but yes, please ask me any questions as they uh, as they occur. 
um, especially if uh, my earlier explanation was not uh, satisfactory. I'm happy to uh, happy to go into more detail. We have plenty of time. So their first generation request uh, was oil painting of abortion protest in Mississippi, which Dolly rejected. Um, at the time, it would strongly reject, as in refuse to do a generation on certain subjects. Um, I experimented with a little bit. It didn't like anything related to death, violence, um, abortion, um, weapons like guns, things of that nature. Since then, the parameters have been adjusted somewhat, and I have been able to get it to generate more things in a broader context that it had previously refused to do. But both the participant and I thought that this raised a very interesting question. Um, the company is called OpenAI, yet they were keeping us from generating something for completely black box reasons. Um, so forbidding the word abortion is a political statement, obviously. Whether it was intentional or not on the part of OpenAI, the company behind Dolly, I can't say. But by um, using the phrase oil painting of a protest in Mississippi instead, we were able to generate the image that, uh, that you see here. And this is more or less at full resolution. Um, these are not particularly high resolution images. Um, I believe that the resolution has increased since um, November. But uh, they're still relatively modest. So we revised the prompt to the oil painting of a 2020-2021 protest in Mississippi. Interviewee 1 had actually been present at actual protests during that time and was interested in comparing what the app was to their actual experience. And you can see the generation there. Um, one of the interesting facets that was noted was the appearance here in sort of an impressionist style of the Mississippi State Capitol building in Jackson, Mississippi. And here you can see interviewee number one's third and final generation. They decided to seize upon the appearance of the Mississippi Capitol Dome in the image and added Jackson, Mississippi to their previous uh, query. So it became oil painting of a 2020-2021 protest in Jackson, Mississippi. They leaned into it, so to speak. Um, the things that they remarked upon the most here were the appearance of some landmarks. This is, once again, the Capitol that you can see there in the middle. Um, that large structure to the left is a parking garage that actually exists in Jackson, Mississippi. And in the foreground, you can see there are what appear to be two figures in red robes. And uh, the interviewee interpreted these as figures dressed in red outfits from The Handmaid's Tale, which, if you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, is a piece of uh, speculative dystopian fiction about a future fundamentalist society where women are reduced to an almost chattel level of uh, societal participation and are forced to parade around in, uh, in red robes. So interviewee number two was a studio art printmaking MFA student who specialized in uh, cyanotypes. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with cyanotypes, it essentially is a type of printmaking and dyeing that uses um, cyan or blue colored inks predominantly. Um, their work explored themes of natural scenes, environmental issues. They uh, noted to me that they were vastly preferred physical art to digital, as you might imagine, being a printmaking uh, student focusing in a very specialized type of slightly antique printmaking. And they were also a non-native English speaker. So you can see their first uh, generation here. 
And the prompt was printmaking of lake pollution, comma, contamination. Again, other than the quote marks, that is the, um, the prompt that they gave uh, word for word. Um, and of the four images, this is the one that they felt was the closest to, um, to what they had been looking for. And they were particularly interested to see that the color is a bit distorted, but this actually looks like a cyanotype. I suppose you could call it more of a telotype than a cyanotype, if you know your color theory. But the strong monochromatic focus and the overall bluish tinge are very much hallmarks of your traditional cyanotypes. You can see here their second generation, which was to add the word uh, cyanotype to their query. Again, they chose to lean into an emergent feature that they saw in the earlier generations. Um, and again, this also matched their specialization quite well. You can see the result there. It has the proper cyan hue now, and it also has white bands at the top and bottom, which are suggestive of a Polaroid photo, even if uh, any photographers in the audience can see that the dimensions aren't quite right there. And their uh, third and final query was adding the term scientific features um, to this because they are very they were very interested in uh, pollution, contamination, and other scientific themes, and were hoping to emphasize those in this final generation. And you can see the results there. Again, the cyan hue is correct. You can see that there are also Polaroid-like bars, uh, even though they aren't quite right, and the upper bar is actually slants slightly upward in a particularly distracting uh, fashion. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And um, interviewee two, our cyanotype expert, noted that there were some features of collage in this generation, um, despite collage not being particularly scientific. And I, um, I was willing to accept their word for it. I'm not uh, the biggest student of collage, but since they were the cyanotype expert, I was happy to accept their word on it. And finally, interviewee number three was an instructor in uh, the art history department with a specialization in the history of photography and a doctorate from major international art school. They were the only participant who had experimented with Dolly 2 prior to the workshop. I had corresponded with um, some possible participants and let them know that this is what we are going to do. So uh, this participant was the only one that availed himself of the tool beforehand. And they were interested um, in Dolly 2's um, ability to serve as either an artist's tool for rapid prototyping or uh, something that could spur discussion about art and photography, a uh, gadfly, if you will. So we attempted a generation um, from uh, the definition of uh, surrealism, as you can see, the chance meeting upon a dissecting table of an umbrella and a sewing machine, which is a direct quote from a work that was embraced by the early Dadaists. If you're not an art history student, Dada was a school of early 20th century art that was famously um, impish and, like we were talking about a moment ago, gadfly-ish. Um, one of their most famous works is the urinal turned on its side and signed, if you're familiar with that. So the Dada movement was very interested in interrogating and playing with what it meant to be art. And they were some of the creators of what we know now as surrealism, things like that. However, Dali rejected this prompt as well, possibly because of its inclusion of the term dissecting table. Um, that may have tripped its violence uh, filter or some other hidden item inside of the program. Again, other than a very generic 
um, mentioned in Dolly's terms of use, there is not really many guidelines about why these queries were rejected. And again, despite the company's name, OpenAI, it's a very closed and opaque system that is determining what is worthy and not worthy of being actually turned into an image. We modified it and we changed dissecting table to lab table. And you can see the result there, which is um, almost like a photograph or a 3D rendering. And interviewee three was very disappointed with this uh, image. Um, they said it was prosaic and it had more elements of a still life than Dadaist uh, surrealism. Given the name Dali 2, with its nod to Salvador Dali, you might expect something a little more out there. And interviewee 3 was a little bit disappointed by this. Here you can see their second generation, which added the term surrealism explicitly at the beginning of the definition. Um, they were attempting to force Dali to be more surrealist, which is a sentence that most art history people never thought that they would utter. Um, and they found this to be much more satisfying. Um, in particular, the uh, quote unquote melty and biomorphic um, effects that you can see in that hovering figure between the uh, candy corn shoe bird and the umbrella, as well as the figure seated at the end of the table. Um, appealed to a more Salvador Dali-esque um, sensibility. And interviewee number three's uh, final generation was this one here, um, which moved surrealism from the beginning to the end. They were particularly curious about what difference the word order would make. And as you can see, Adding surrealism at the end seems to have resulted in a more classically surrealist image. Um, again, I don't want to assume anyone has any sort of knowledge of um, art or art history, but Interviewee 3 um, particularly noted um, influences from uh, surrealists based on various uh, facets of this uh, image. Um, the bird, shoe, the dressmaker's dummy. Um, those all uh, suggested to them artists like uh, Rene Magritte, uh, Max Ernst, and Joan Miro. And I apologize if anyone does know their art history and I butchered those names. I'm more used to reading them than I am to speaking them. So with that said, these are the responses that the interviewees gave me on the questionnaire. These are the pieces of metadata that they thought were uh, interesting and important to collect alongside any such um, AI art generations if these images were to be used in any sort of classroom or library context. As you can see, uh, interviewee three said everything. Collect as much data as you possibly can, um, and if we don't need it, it can be discarded. Whereas the other two were a bit more selective in um, what they were talking about. and. The other that interviewee three checked, their other was everything possible. So the next and final step of the workshop was to add the results as well as the metadata that was specified in the questionnaire responses um, to EGRO, which is the University of Mississippi's institutional repository. And I apologize for the small size. Um, you can see a screenshot of the uh, page within our institutional repository there. And the sharp eyed among you can see that there are some of our rejects in there as well. You can see some additional um, cyanotypes and some additional generations of the um, surrealist type. That's just a, an overall um, an overall preview, though. The full slate of images is a uh, is a quicker way. So, with the workshop in the rearview mirror, what are my takeaways? And again, your takeaways may vary 
Um, that's a discussion that I'm looking forward to having. But um, the first is that librarians and archivists need to plan for when, not if, but when images that are created in whole or in part by generative AI are included in institutional data structures, be this in instruction, in uh, institutional repositories, or in some other form um, that uh, people will have yet to dream up, or simply one that I'm omitting or overlooking. Um, your metadata standards, fields, and coding could all stand to be codified, especially since this is a type of information. Um, the, uh, the, gener the generative uh, images are a type of information that is somewhat distinct and unique from what we are uh, used to dealing with. Um, and I feel like, given the results of this workshop, seeking input from actual practicing trained artists is a good first step toward looking at this, not just examining it through a library lens, an instruction lens, but also um, an art lens, an art history lens. Some ethical takeaways as well. Um, there is no getting around the fact, and this is something that came up repeatedly during the workshop, that the images in the data sets used to create those images that you saw were scraped, i.e. taken, from the internet without permission without the permission of the person who created them, without permission of the rights holder, without permission of any kind, with a simple hand wave of fair use. And one of the other points that came up was, this may mean that there can be no ethical use of generative AI artwork, in the same way that there can be no ethical use of cocaine in a library. Um, so what implications does this offer for a library archive institution that ingests such artworks? Is more metadata the answer by providing more information about when, by whom, and how these images were generated? Um, does that address the ethical questions about the nature of these data sets and their potential for using things unethically or even in an abusive way? Dolly um, was generally very proactive in refusing to allow us to generate images that it thought, based on its own internal algorithm from OpenAI, would be harmful. But there are other products out there. Certainly, Dolly isn't the only one. Um, there are other products out there that have no such compunction and that you could very easily use um, as a bad actor um, in creating things like deep fakes, prank images, things of those nature. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for your time and attention. Um, I am going to go ahead and welcome your uh, questions, comments, and suggestions. I've got my email address up there for you all. Um, I also have a few other uh, reference uh, resources, rather, that I would like to um, just talk over briefly. Um, you can see my uh, first QR code is for uh, my references. Feel free to look at that. The second is for a draft paper that has been prepared. Um, this includes um, a more thorough discussion of individual images including some of the ones that uh, were not included in this uh, presentation for concerns of time and scope. Um, that draft paper has been submitted to and accepted by um, Brick and Quick, and I'll be presenting on it at Brick and Quick um, on, the, uh, on the 3rd of November, I believe. Um, so if any of you are registered for Brick and Quick, I may see you there, and you'll have the opportunity to see me go through this uh, all over again. However, there is an additional uh, URL there that is for additional AI resources from the University of Mississippi. Um, the organizers and I were speaking about this um, before we began. The University of Mississippi, and in particular our um, writing department, the Department of Writing and Rhetoric, have been extremely forward and proactive in looking at um, classroom use and ethical concerns with AI, primarily text AI, things like ChatGPT. Um, 
but still, it's something that has been a major focus of a large number of extremely dedicated and intelligent people here. And they have put together um, some resources, which you can find at that link, which are, in my opinion, absolute dynamite for um, broadening your understanding of the topic. Again, with more of a text-based focus than what we were talking about a moment ago, but still. And also very useful as models for your own institutions uh, going forward. I'll just go ahead and uh, and leave that up for the time being so that people can capture that information if they would like. Um, but I'm happy to field any questions at this time. Alex, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do so. I really appreciate you having me. Of course. Um, so we will give people a little bit of time if they have any questions. We don't currently have any in the chat right now, but we want to give people as much time as possible to be able to type their questions into the chat if they have any. Yeah. And another thing that we were talking about before the session began was some other work that I'm doing with those kind of generative AI um, uh, texts and citations that were turned into the library for people that were interested in um, finding them, hallucinated information, all sorts of things like that. So, um, ah, you're welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, thank you. That's, that's very uh, appreciated. Um, If yeah, I anyone... think, oh, I'm oh, sorry, Alex, I was just going to say that ever since I um, found that phrase of the hallucination citations, um, I just, I love that phrase because we've already started to see at my institution at Bowling Green State University, um, students that come to us with um, citations that are from ChatGPT and that don't exist. So we've already started to put it in our reference interview to ask them if they've gotten that from ChatGPT because we've seen it so much already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ha. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I'm glad that you appreciate the rhetoric there. <laughs> um, the the fun thing is uh, not not to go off topic about the uh, the hallucinated citations, but to go off topic about the hallucinated citations. Um, I was attempting to generate some hallucinations using ChatGPT in advance of my presentation for the Mississippi Library Association last week, where I talked about dissecting some of the hallucinations that we've received um on our library chat service and in between may and now it's actually started displaying a warning if you try to uh if you try to generate citations um it will say i'm not connected to the internet i'm not connected to your databases it wouldn't be appropriate um but you can still trick it easily enough um, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't actually tried asking it for sources, so I didn't realize that it has now had that disclaimer on there. That's very interesting. Okay, we've got a question from mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth. Um, Alex, thank you for sharing today. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, will you please elaborate on the planning of the Dolly workshop? How did you collaborate with professors to spread the word of your workshop? Thanks in advance for sharing the backstory. Okay, that's a that's a good question, Elizabeth. Um, what I was primarily interested in was uh, reaching out to the broadest art uh, audience that I could get. You might argue in uh, retrospect that I failed somewhat in doing that. Um, so uh, you'd certainly be forgiven for seeking out other ways of getting into contact with the art folks at your institution. But the way I did it was there is no central art listserv that I have access to. So what I did instead was I took my normal um, information that I use to, um, I'm the art librarian, um, the art and art history librarian. So I'm their library liaison already. I already have people's information and I already work with some of them. So I sent out a request for a collaborator uh, or collaborators who'd be willing to ho help me put this together and get the workshop assembled. Um, to see if anyone was interested in it. And that's how we were able to get everything put together um, as it came together by uh, seeking out a collaborator within the art department via a direct mailing. If I were to, if I had this to do over again, I might 
try to put it out more broadly, see if I could send it to all of the art students rather than all of the art faculty, perhaps um, try to arrange it further ahead of time. Um, this wound up being done with about three weeks notice. I probably could have done significantly better there. Um, and I may also have been able to open it up to a broader campus audience if I wanted. But as I said in my earlier slides, I was very interested in um, in that artist's perspective, if that makes sense. What time of day did I host the event? Um, it was 11 o'clock to 12.15. That may also explain why I was uh, not able to get as many people as I had hoped for, because those are, those are prime Hunger Games hours. But as anyone who uh, has ever organized a workshop knows, there is no perfect time. You either get them when they're hungry for lunch or sleepy from lunch. Did that answer your question, Elizabeth? No, thank you. Okay, great. Well, seeing no other questions here in the chat, I think we can go ahead and end for today. Alex, again, I want to just thank you for being with us and sharing your work with us. We really appreciate your time. Absolutely. It was my pleasure to do so. I, uh, I hope that folks found it, uh, found it enjoyable. Great. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next time. Have a great day.